So when you look at counseling and psychotherapy, ACA doesn't define um, psychotherapy. Packford defines counseling as working counseling and psychotherapy as someone who works compassionately to help um, you know, people through their difficult life circumstances. They talk about counseling as ad addressing um, particular issues of concerns um, you know, with individual couple or family and psychotherapy. They define it as a long-term process that focuses on self and um, looks at both conscious and unconscious. I personally think this definition is too old and very, very limited. In general, counseling deals with an issue, it's time limited. Psychotherapy is about recreating human personality. It takes time, you know, we're working through the unconscious, working through the transference, working through counter transference, working through the defenses, psychic determinism, the developmental aspect, it takes time. In Australia, there's no legislative recognition for the title counselor or psychotherapist. There's no legislative recognition for it to be a distinct profession. Psychology became a legislative profession in Australia in 2006. We don't have that yet. But as in UK, if you look at in 2014, Health Professions Council separated the title counselor and psychotherapist you know, they became legally protected title. Of course, they brought in rigorous training standards as well. P-bands in, in New Zealand, Psychotherapy Board of um, Aeteria and New Zealand. In 2017, they separated the title as well, counselors and psychotherapists. Pretty much in around the world as well, whether you look at US, U, EU, it's a legislated um, title. In UK, psychotherapists have the capacity to make mental health diagnosis and also treat uh, serious um, mental health concerns as well, not uh, serious um, serious personality disorders. So what we see is, is in this industry, I mean, it be, it's a self-governing profession. You either belong to PACFA as a counselor or psychotherapist, you belong to ACA or you belong to um, ANZA. So we're not subject to national health uh, um, sorry, let me rephrase that, National Health Practitioner Regulation Law, 2009. What we've seen is, is states and territories come up with code of conduct for unregistered health practitioners. Since 2015, they've been talking about developing national code of conduct for healthcare workers who are in the self-regulating industry, like counselors and psychotherapists and other allied health industry, but they've not fully implemented that. So states have already developed. In New South Wales, we came up with this uh, code of conduct for unregistered health practitioners in 2012. South Australia followed um, just a few years afterwards. Victoria still uses New South Wales code of conduct um, uh, for, and Victorian HCCC still uses New South Wales code of conduct for handling cases, um, you know, and Queensland ombudsman as well um, have established their own code of conduct for uh, unregistered uh, health practitioner. So we are self-regulating profession. We either belong to PACFA, ACA, or ANZA. We haven't fully implemented uh, uh, RCAP, uh, but that's, that's PACFA and ACA's uh, uh, responsibility. So there's this dimensions now to, um, to maintaining your professional uh, um, standards. So you know, one, one is your uh, individual, where you're trained in ethics, um, you self-regulate in engaging with the client, then you also belong to a professional body. So both are reflecting on each other. So if I belong to PACFA, if I belong to ANZAP, if I belong to ACA, my actions will impact on the, um, the professional body as well, or the, the organization. And the organization's actions can also impact me as a professional. So, um, which is why we have, um, how do I put it? And a feature within the code of uh, uh, ethics in PACFA about bringing uh, disrepute to the profession. So as an individual practitioner, you know, guidelines for certain behaviors, or sorry, guidelines for professional behaviors will come in, in many, many forms. So. They ultimately, they're related to ethics. So, you know, if you have gone through the portal and looked at week one's content, you would have noticed significant, uh, uh, you know, 
variations of code of ethics. You'll see code of practice, code of professional behaviors, code of best practice as well. And organizations do use them um, interchangeably as well. You know, but basically they're guidelines. They're guidelines that are set on what we can do, what we can't do in the uh, industry. So if we do breach, if we do breach, we'll be held accountable for um, our actions. So when you look at the history of code of ethics as well, you know, uh, code of ethics have existed in the history since you know, Hammurabi's time, Solomon's time as well. They're there to guide people. What Moses got on Mount Sinai, you know, the 10 commandments, thou shall not, a guidance for people's behavior. Professional bodies have code of ethics as well. Almost all the professionals, including plumbers, you know, uh, have, have code of ethics or code of conduct. Mafia also has a code of ethics. I mean, and if you look at uh, or code of conduct, at least, I mean, um, you know, you could rob from others, you could, uh, you know, exhort, you could kill, but you don't snitch on um, our own. Police have code of ethics, the official code of ethics. And then of course, these, the blue code of ethics where you don't snitch on another policeman uh, mishandling, um, mishandling a criminal. Now, in part of being a professional, part of being um, linked to a professional organization is one, I mean, you get a, a, a professional identity. You also adhere to the code of, um, you know, um, conduct. In self-regulating industries such as PACFA, ACA, ASW, um, ANZA, um, being accredited to a professional body gives us a professional identity, but as an individual, I will have some kind of autonomy as well. Autonomy to engage with the clients in my practice. But with that autonomy also comes an immense responsibility as well for my own personal, professional, and ethical uh, 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 um, growth as well. So the concept of self-regulation, you know, um, is also applied as well to pack for the concept of self-regulation is also applied to other self-regulating bodies such as ACA. So a good, good example of self-regulation is available on pack for website. If you go onto pack for website and just do a Google search on self-regulation, what you'll see is five-year reports submitted submitted to, um, I'm not sure whether it's ACN or the, the Australian Charities Commission, but it's also submitted to the members and to the general public on what PACFA as an industry body is doing to maintain a good ethical uh, standards in self-regulation. So I I'm happy to post that link as well in, um, uh, on the portal. So what is ethics? Ethics is basically a set of values. They're individual and social constructs. Oh, there we go. And um, generally, I mean, ethics can be referred to as study of people's moral behavior. The word ethics, of course, comes from the Greek word ethikos, which refers to a person's character. It refers to a person's behavior in a social setting. May I ask uh, people to mute themselves, um, picking up a lot of background noise. So ethical behavior is also very synonymous as well with moral uh, behavior. You know, the uh, ethics needs to be always considered in, in the context. So when you're looking at it from an individual or a social uh, construct, we have to consider the context. For example, I'm a borderline vegan, uh, vegan sorry, yet I cook meat for my dogs, but I don't impose my veganism on my animals. My mother, who is a born vegetarian, a devout Hindu, is appalled that I keep meat in my fridge. My dogs can be a delicacy in another country thousand miles away. All of us are right. We need to consider the context here. So when you're looking at the profession, for example, as a healthcare profession, we have certain duties, we have certain obligations as well. And we have obligations to engage compassionately with the client. But when you look at a business industry, or when you look at business ethics, 
profit motive will also play in the ethical decision making process. So when you look at um, the reasoning behind I mean, ethics makes us question why certain behaviors or approaches should be evaluated in a certain way. So we kind of attempt to address the question, what should I do? What is my behavior? Or how is my behavior gonna impact? What's my goal of my action? Ethical codes are set by professional bodies to protect us, the therapists. Ethical codes are set by professional bodies to protect the client. Ethical codes are set by professional bodies to reassure the public that we practice within a certain frame. And if we go beyond, beyond these, um, um, these codes, then punitive actions can be taken. So when you, know, when you look at HCCC cases or when you look at PACFA cases, or even if you look at a pack for complaint form as well, what you see is asking uh, practitioners to adhere to certain ethical uh, standards or asking the complainant also to indicate what ethical standards the practitioner has breached. Look at the uh, pack for ACA answer complaints form and, and, and you'll see principles clearly listed and asking the complainant to, to clearly indicate what the practitioner may have breached. If I, uh, a complaint has been made against me, by a member of public, by another practitioner, HCCC or PACFA Ethics Committee will look at what I've done in relation to the ethical codes of conduct and professional standards. Of course, they may be open as well to uh, interpretation. Um, you know, ethical codes are not set in stones. They are in principles, you know, um, that says do's and don'ts. Sometimes judgment requires us to be open to interpretation as well. So they may involve law, they may involve legal issues. So, but knowledge of ethical theory is extremely important for us. Knowledge of ethical codes is extremely important for us. Ethical dilemmas are experienced by practitioners pretty much every day, consciously or unconsciously. At times, of course, um, you know, the codes are very clear on what we need to do, what we can't do. There are times, of course, when the clothes may not give clear answers. So at that time, we have to rely again on our own moral compass as well. One of the things that I would ask you to do is to go through codes thoroughly, but also would advise you to compare codes as well. Just don't look at PACFA codes or ACA code. Compare PACFA codes to APS codes. Compare PACFA codes to a um, ASW codes of ethics. And what you'll see is variation. We at the moment are developing an, um, another code of ethics for the member association that I'm connected with. And it's not written overnight, just like DSM. We take a few years to write a code of ethics. We have to see the context. We have to see the changes in society. For example, if you compare PACFA's 2007 code of ethics, sorry, 2017 code of ethics to 2015 code of ethics and to 2012 code of ethics, especially around boundaries, dual relationship, and close personal relationship with the client, you'll see significant variation. And they reflect the changing context that's happening around us as well. If you look at APS code of ethics on close personal um, relationship, ASW codes as well on close personal relationship, there's variation. The irony as well is, is that none of these codes also define what close personal relationship is. So again, that, that requires um, you know, the judgment of uh, the practitioner, but also the judgment of uh, the panel as well. Um, codes of conduct, code of ethics, unfortunately they have still not kept with technology. So in 2020, we realized this. In none of the codes, if you look at PACFA 2017 code, they only have two paragraphs on um, technology. Last two years, we've been doing sessions over Zoom. Pretty much my practice entirely for during COVID time was on Zoom. Half the people I spoke to still spend about 50% of their time on Zoom. Codes of ethics, regulations, laws have not kept up with the technological advance, uh, um, advances as well. So yeah, I advise you to look into code of conduct, code of ethics, um, Thoroughly. 
And what you'll also notice as well is commonality among codes of all helping profession. So Karen Kirchner in 1984 highlighted the commonality of five principles associated with all the codes. Unfortunately, her paper is not part of the prescribed reading. Unfortunately, you can't also access her paper through EBSCO database. Um, but she highlighted in a 1984 paper, autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, fidelity, and justice. When you compare PAC for Code of Ethics, when you compare APS Code of Ethics, when you compare uh, Australian uh, Psychiatry College Code of Ethics, ACA Code of Ethics, or ASW Code of Ethics, you'll find these five principles. When you look at our own ethical um, engagement with the client, pretty much everything we do can be seen through the lens of these five principles, whether we are maintaining confidentiality, client information that we get, not harming the patient, our own professional development, our own self-care can be seen through these five principles. Autonomy, autonomy focuses on the client's ability to self-determine whether they want to start the therapy or whether they want to stop the therapy or whether they want to go to another therapist. Non-maleficence is about doing no harm to the client. This includes the language we use in therapy. This includes boundaries. It includes boundary crossings, boundary transgressions, maintaining confidentiality. You know, just because the client has given me the information in therapy doesn't mean that I have right to fully broadcast in an ACAP class. But broadcasting that, I have committed harm to the client. So you can see principles of you know, a confidentiality through the lens of non-maleficence. Beneficence is about doing good for the client. That includes self-care, maintaining healthy boundaries, professional development, ongoing tr uh, training, being fit to practice, engaging with the client according to our competence um, in training. Fidelity is about being tr truthful and honest to the client. Um, <clears throat> and justice, treating all the clients with fairness and equality as well. It's also you know, involves honoring commitments as well. So just because somebody comes from Eastern suburbs and pays me with a black Amex card doesn't mean that they get 15 minutes extra. All my appointments are 45 minutes. Just because somebody comes from a Western suburbs and counts cons before they pay doesn't mean that I'm gonna stop the session at 40 minutes or they're $5 short. No, it's treating the clients um, fairly, all the clients. <clears throat> so if you do get an opportunity to get this paper, my advice to you is to look at this paper thoroughly as well. It's, it'll be immensely useful when you write your assignments. So what's an ethical dilemma? talked about code of conducts, we talked about professional standards. Ethical dilemma is one when we experience cognitive dissonance. Ethical dilemma is one where there's more than two outcomes. In therapy, we experience ethical dilemmas pretty much every day. Trust me on this, even if I open the session, my, my practice door two minutes late, to me it's an ethical dilemma. Or finishing the session on time, or finishing the session two minutes earlier, can be seen uh, depending on the context as an ethical dilemma. Managed reporting, dual relationship, maintaining confidentiality, boundaries can be seen through I mean, our ethical dilemma. So when there are more than two outcomes, it's an ethical dilemma. When we have two opposing thoughts, it's an ethical dilemma. Both the outcomes can be good. It's still an ethical dilemma because we have to choose one that's far beneficial to the client. Both the outcomes can be bad that we still have to choose an outcome that causes the least harm to the client. This comes up in mandatory reporting. We see reporting the client and involving docs or uh, whatever they call now to losing the therapeutic relationship with the client. In that way, you know, we are looking at what causes the least harm. So when you look at the uh, ethical dilemmas. I mean, they have existed in society. People have questioned you know, what constitutes the right action. So, and if you look at Aristotle, go back even to, to the early, uh, you know, epics, um, like in the, the Mahabharata, uh, the Chinese uh, scriptures to Egyptian writings, ethical thinking has existed in the society throughout. We have always questioned, you know, uh, what makes a person morally good, what constitutes the right action, 
how do we define moral action? You know, if you look at Aristotle's writings, he talked about you know, the virtue ethics, and he talked about you know, the, the, we need to consider the virtue of the person. And we, if the person is morally good, then you know, actions they do are acceptable. Or, um, you know, um, but then you know, people have subsequently questioned what makes a person morally good? What makes a person courageous? What makes a person kind? Should we look at the motive? Should we look at the character and the intention as well of the person before we decide whether the action is right or wrong? Then we started looking at actions as well. You know, what constitutes the right action? You know, should we look at um, you know, uh, the person behind it? Um, or should we look at the character of the person? Or should we have look at uh, other considerations as well before we decide the action is right or wrong? And then of course, the consequentialists came up as well, and they started looking at you know um, you know what constitutes a good um, or bad uh, consequence. We have debated this over centuries, and 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 then we continue to debate. So, the reason behind ethical thinking and moral um, thinking is is to come to an agreement on justification. So, when you have a co cognitive dissonance, when you have two opposing thoughts, you need to come to a justification in order to proceed. So we have relied for centuries. We have relied on uh, preachings of uh, you know, the religious scriptures. In, um, in the, um, you know, we then in the 17th and 18th century we started moving towards um, uh, philosophical ethics. So what happened uh, with, with the development of philosophical ethics in the 17th and 18th century is, if you look at the um, in, you know the, the, the Europe at that time. Um, we, um, you know, it was ruled by monarchs, and and of course the French Revolution uh, got rid of the king. King Louis the Sixteenth got guillotined, but along with him, the first estate and the second estate lost the power. The religion or the church, the Vatican plus the nobility, lost the power. Religion was primarily influential in guiding people on what to do through the king. The king didn't belong to the uh, belong to any of the estate. The third estate came to power. People started questioning, how are we going to live if we don't have any religious guidance? All well, Europe changed overnight. And then, of course, uh, we started seeing philosophical ethics develop. Deontology came, Kantian ethics came in the 17th and 18th century, immediately after the French Revolution. But we also have to consider the context as well. Europe was in war with everyone, pretty much. You know, they were, and if you look at um, what happened in Europe during that century, when small kingdoms were fighting against each other, going to war, duty-bound ethics was, was a valid argument. And later on in the 18th and 19th century, we, we started seeing utilitarianism come. We also, later on, as we established uh, you know, democracy and we started uh, you know, moving away from colonies, we, we, you know, we started focusing more on regulations as well, laws uh, determined by constitutions determined by, um, um, uh, by, by legislation. Now, all these are used for justification. So if you look at um, recently, I mean, I think during Trump time, Jeff Session, the American attorney general, who was meant, meant to be upholding law, cited a religious scripture to justify an abhorrent action of separating mothers from the babies at the border. The babies were locked separately. And what he said was, it's very biblical to obey the law. Now, he was using justification system, again, you know, to justify an abhorrent action, but he was also appealing to people of, of the vote bank that he had. But what he didn't realize is that the same justification system, or he may have realized, was used by Nazis was used by Nazis in, during the genocide. It was used by South Africa to, um, you know, uh, for the, during the apartheid, but also by the US governments during the slavery movement as well, to segregate people and to keep people as slaves, to kill um, millions and millions of people. We use the same justification system. Jeff Sessions said it's very biblical to obey the law. So we use these arguments. We use these arguments for justification system. So when you look at, and we bring in ethical theories, you know, if you look at the major ethical theories, we have, oops, sorry, 
We have um, deontology, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, and the rights of things. You know, deontology. Deontology talks about people adhering to obligations and duties. But again, I, as I mentioned, consider the context when these theories developed. As I said, Europe was going into war. Utilitarianism, you know, they talked about the greatest benefit for the majority of the people. Virtue ethics focused on the character of the person, going back to Aristotle. Rights-based ethics are protected and given the highest priority by the legislation or the law. So justification system, as I mentioned, can also be used to convert twisted arguments and, and logical fallacies into kind of an ethical ideal as well, what Jeff Sessing did or what Trump did and others, you know, or what others did as well. So it's important that, that in our professional standards or professional capacity, we go through the professional standards and code of ethics. We use them for justification system. But at the same time, it's also important that we go through the ethical decision-making uh, process as well. These theories have been validated validated by academics, validated by peers, that it's the right way to proceed when we experience ethical dilemmas. So one, it you know, involves identifying ethical uh, uh, problems, but at the same time, it gives you a step-by-step -step procedure to find the solution, consult the code of ethics, consult the legislation, consult the peers, consider the impact from multiple perspectives, consider the impact as a client, consider the impact as um, you know, the therapist, and then apply an outcome. I mean, that's a very simple way of putting a ethical decision-making process um, in a 30-second uh, statement. It takes time, though. It takes time for us to develop a good decision-making process. So in week five and six, we'll be looking at this in depth. Um, so we'll look at Welfeld's model, we'll look at Hawley's model, we'll look at Corey's eight-step model, and we'll also look at Pope and Vasquez's model. Australian Public Service Commission also has a good ethical decision-making model. I may bring that in um, for your tutorial activities. You're welcome to look at um, uh, the various justification models in your um, Tavidas textbook, Koton and Tavidas textbook, but I would also advise you to look at Welfell, Georgina Hawley. I'm more than happy to post this on the forum as well. Um, Corey's uh, eight-step model, and for, for assessment too, you will be looking at ethical decision-making models. So when you're looking at the um, making effective decisions, I mean, the models codes will help us to resolve, uh, will help us the best to resolve ethical issues uh, encountered by us sometimes, you know, they may not, but they do provide us with principles. They do provide us with standards. They provide us with values. They will provide us with overall framework on how to approach an ethical dilemma and make a decision-making uh, uh, or initiate a decision-making process. Code of ethics, professional standards, professional values, code of conduct, they advise us on our professional responsibilities. They provide us with a professional explanation of the actions that we can engage in uh, when we are working with a patient. I advise you to look into this um, subject seriously. Um, as I said, foundations of our professions are built on absolute honesty and integrity. You know, we need to be aware of the ethical principles, but also we need to have our own ethical barometer as well active. So review the professional code of ethics thoroughly, make a comparison, review the professional guidelines as well. I'll give you extensive study materials and also give you the handouts as well. They will be uploaded in um, the weekly sections as we go along. Engage with your tutors. They come up with, uh, sorry, they're, they're very well experienced and they come with a lot of, exp uh, lot of uh, background in ethics. Engage in tutorial activities as well. I. Um, um, will bring in a lot of case studies, help you to go through the step-by-step uh, -step process as well. And most importantly as well, look, as far for very um, higher level of practice, always question, always question, is this action right? You know, um, is my action impacting the client certain way? 
So aspirational ethics is what we aim for. You know, the subject will teach you mandatory ethics, the principles, the codes, the legislational requirement. But when you're working with somebody vulnerable, you need to focus on aspirational ethics. 